it's a ra- rather a strange thing to to think that over a quarter of a century after Ukraine became an independent state, that there is now probably one of the biggest threats to its existence um, continuing as an independent country. You would have thought that um, a quarter of a century would have placed Ukraine firmly on the map and there wouldn't really be a threat to its existence. But we obviously were wrong. Um, two two factors um, are taking place here, which will be crucial in 2017, which didn't really exist in the last few years. Firstly, um, Vladimir Putin has not given up his hope of transforming Ukraine into a kind of a Belarusian-style dominion, uh, where he basically controls the foreign defense policy of Ukraine, and he has a sort of a local satrap along the lines of Lukashenko in Belarus or Yanukovych in Ukraine to run domestic affairs on his behalf. That's Putin's wet dream for Ukraine. He thought he had that in December 2013 when he bribed Viktor Yanukovych, then the president, um, with this so-called loan. Um, of 15 million, 3 billion of which was dispersed. We don't know where that money went. Of course, it's probably stolen along with everything else. Um, and the idea was Yanukovych turns away from Europe. He becomes a Russian satrap. He um, stays in power. He's re-elected in 2015 with Russian help. And then he gets Ukraine to join the Euro, uh, CIS Customs Union, which in 2015 becomes the Eurasian Economic Union. This was Putin's plan all along. didn't quite go like that. We know very well, uh, Euromaidan revolution, Ukrainians didn't agree, um, and then Putin was very angry, so he annexed the Crimea and began a war in eastern Ukraine. But he hasn't given up a hope of returning to that question. Uh, one reason being is that he fervently believes, like the majority of people in the Russian Republic, that Ukrainians and Russians are one people, Adin Narod, as he keeps talking about it, that they all lived happily in Kiev Rus um, just a, a month ago um, in the center of Moscow, a monument to uh, Grand Prince Volodymyr, the ruler of Kiev Rus uh, from the 10th to 11th century, was unveiled in a city, Moscow, that didn't even exist at the time. Um, so hence he's making a claim to the territory of Kiev Rus. Um, if you believe that Ukrainians and Belarusians are basically just Russians with a funny sort of dialect, um, funny customs and costumes, um, then you're not going to accept that they can have an existence outside the Russian sphere of influence. And so that kind of wet dream of Putin um, will continue um, even though it clashes fundamentally with the transformation of Ukrainian national identity that's particularly taken place since 2014, but even more generally since 1991 in the remainder of Ukraine. Now, um, Putin's hope is that eventually he'll wear down the West and that they will come to accept that he's not going anywhere, and that the best solution for the Ukrainian problem, in inverted commas, will be um, some kind of Finlandization, shall we say, um, and the end and an end to, to sanctions. Um, this line has been pushed in the West for a number of years by far left um, academics and um, media commentators. In the U.S., this is Stephen Cohen, of course, the editor of The Nation magazine. In Britain, academics like Richard Sacqua. Um, but it also has support, besides the far left, it has support on the right of U.S. politics amongst so-called realists who also, like the far left, blame um, the West, blame America, EU, democracy promotion, NATO and EU enlargement um, for the crisis in Ukraine. They basically all let off Putin from this blaming him for this crisis. It's a fault of the West. Um, and in many ways, 
This is the view of Donald Trump. The realists have Donald Trump's ear, um, who will become president of the U.S. on the 20th of January. Just two days before, Ukraine celebrates its Day of Independence in 1918. And this is where we get to the congruence of, of, of ideas and, and policies that are potentially dangerous for Ukraine for the first time, really, since the early 1990s uh, between uh, the U.S., Donald Trump, and Vladimir Putin. They seem to have a love affair. Um, the expulsion of 35 um, Russian intelligence agents and diplomats just yesterday by President Barack Obama um, was not responded to by the Russians, which is usually the case. They usually would have, re- have expelled the same number of Americans. Um, and President elect Trump uh, said Putin's a great guy for not doing that. Usually, president elects don't actually comment during their period of time prior to becoming the president. But here he is commenting and saying how Putin's a great guy because he didn't respond in kind. This, of course, is very dangerous. The only time really in the last 25 years when there's been a kind of a Russophile, I would say, president in Washington, is it was Bush Sr. And we all remember his chicken Kiev speech in the summer of, of 1991, just a few months before Ukraine declared independence. And in the early 1990s, uh, Bush Sr. promoted a Russia first policy, ignoring Ukraine, Belarus and the other non-Russian republics. But then we had pretty much the more typical American presidents. Um, Bill Clinton was good for Ukraine. Ukraine became the third recipient of aid after Egypt and Israel. And then we had Bush Jr., who also supported Ukraine to a great degree with Dick Cheney. Um, Barack Obama, for all his faults, also um, was not not as good as Bush Jr. and Bill Clinton. But nevertheless, he wasn't a Russophile. Um, He was slow to react. He was a bit timid, but he certainly wasn't a Russophile. But now we have Trump. The danger here is that Trump acts on his rhetoric of um, of establishing very close relations um, with Vladimir Putin over the heads of Ukrainians, the and and the rhetoric which is being um, introduced into policy proposals that um, Henry Kissinger, coming out of retirement for the fiftieth time, um, to act uh, to act as a kind of intermediary, whereby. He would um, negotiate with Putin an end to sanctions and the allocation of Ukraine, Georgia, and the other non-Russian republics of the former USSR to lie within Russia's sphere of influence. So a kind of a a, a 19th century imperialism, a division of Europe into spheres of influence, Um, and Ukraine's Finlandization, which would... Um, require Ukraine to drop any goals of EU and NATO membership. Now, um, this is a kind of argument, of course, being made in today's um, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by Viktor Pinchuk, the Ukrainian oligarch, who, being an opportunist, as all oligarchs are in Ukraine, seeks to now also also be alongside Kissinger, uh, the intermediary between Trump and Kiev and Moscow. He argues that Ukraine should drop its um, goals of EU membership. Um, He already said 10 years ago in another article um, that Ukraine should drop NATO membership. Now he's saying Ukraine should drop EU membership. This is rather strange for Pinchuk, coming from somebody who over a decade ago, created the Alt-European strategy, which uh, allegedly lobbies for Ukraine's membership of the EU. So to be consistent, he needs to now close down the Alt-European strategy because he no longer believes that should be the goal for Ukraine. Um, So a kind of a Finlandization, no EU-NATO membership, um, a Russian basically satrap in charge. This is what uh, Kissinger, Trump, Pinchuk, um, the, some far-left commentators like Stephen Cohen, Aqua, 
um, and realists are proposing for Ukraine. Um, is this possible? Is this likely? Um, well, the, the main thing that when great powers, so-called great powers, um, allocate countries to spheres of influence, what they tend to ignore is that um, is the public opinion of those countries. Um, why should Ukrainians, Georgians, or whoever um, remain passive and agree to become uh, countries to to live in semi-independent countries within uh, somebody else's spheres of influence? And why should they agree to that? And this is where I think this these kind of proposals fall down. I just don't believe that the majority of Ukrainians today will a vote for a vote democratically to bring to power a Russian satrap. Um, today, the most popular uh, political leaders in Ukraine, if there was a presidential election, are Yuli Tymoshenko and Petro Poroshenko. Um, they are very different. They are, they are very critical of each other. But the, neither of them are Russian satraps. Um, and even Yuri Boyko, I somehow don't think, would go completely down that road. So the idea that somehow Ukraine would hold up its hands in the air and surrender and agree to any kind of proposal made by Trump, Kissinger and Pinchuk is rather naive and ridiculous. Uh, Russia tried to impose its um, solution on Ukraine in 2014 and it completely failed. So there's a, certainly a danger um, um, on the part of Trump, but there's, I think, strong opposition to that within Ukraine. A new national identity has been created since 2014. And I think there's also strong opposition to that in parts of Europe, including, by the way, in Germany, which never used to be an ally of Ukraine, because German leaders certainly now believe that Putin is out to destroy the EU and NATO. And also within um, large segments of particularly the Democratic Party in the U.S., but even large segments of the Republican Party, which believes that there should be even tougher sanctions against Russia for its hacking of the elections in 2016. Um, that's particularly strong among senators. My fear, and many people fear this, is to what degree will the Republican Party in the U.S. be willing to take on Trump in this battle? Or will it, as, it, as we saw during the election campaign, basically roll over and just accept what he promotes. This is going to be um, the big question. Will Paul Ryan, with will these sort of traditionally anti-Russian, anti-Putin senators like Senator McCain, what will they do if Putin disagrees with their views about sanctions and tough responses to Russia? Um, and then, of course, we have strong allies who are very fearful of Ukraine being assigned to some kind of Russian sphere of influence in places like Poland, the Baltic States, Scandinavia, and elsewhere. So it's not a it's not a done deal, but certainly this makes it a very very um, difficult year for Ukraine um, because Trump's policies could make a complete hash of the situation. It could provide this kind of window of, of opportunity that Putin sees that he hopes he could actually try to maybe invade or, or escalate the military confrontation in eastern Ukraine, thinking that there won't be a tough response from Europe and the U.S. And this is where it becomes extremely dangerous. Um, and also, I think, added to that is that 2017 will be um, a year which in some ways resembles 2007-2008 under President Viktor Yushchenko. And here, what I mean is that there's a growing number of Ukrainians who are quite disillusioned with um, President Poroshenko. He is slipping in the opinion polls. Um, he's now sort of second or third in, in rankings um, after Yuli Tymoshenko and Yuri Boyko. Um, he has not really got a grip on de-oligarchization, on fighting high-level corruption, putting people behind bars. Remember the slogan, bandits to jail. 
and 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 also the whole question of justice um, for the crimes committed by Viktor Yanukovych, and um, both in um, robbery of, towards Ukraine, bankrupting Ukraine, murdering protesters, and, and committing treason. You know, Ukrainians want people to go behind bars, and they've they've been very slow on doing that. So that's a domestic domestic tension inside Ukraine. Um, and that constrains President Poroshenko in even being able to uh, to capitulate in the way that Viktor Pinchuk would like. Um, Petro Poroshenko, I don't believe, will do, do that um, because he, A, I don't think he, he believes in it, that Ukraine should somehow make these concessions to Donbass separatists, and B, it's not politically feasible. I mean, they would be strong political instability. So we have all of these things coming together. Trump, if anything, is somebody that creates decisive div- div- divisions, um, indecisiveness. We just simply don't know what he's going to be proposing, what he's going to be tweeting. Uh, I personally believe that down the road, um, a kind of a reset of relations between the U.S. and Russia is not possible. The contradictions are too big. But in the meantime, when he may be trying to do that, that's where the danger lies. In maybe in Putin's eyes, leaving an, op- leaving an opening for him to try to take back Ukraine. And that's where it's going to be very, very dangerous for Ukraine this year. Um, one hopes that other countries... Um, resist the call for the Finlandization of Ukraine, whether that's Canada, Britain, Poland, particularly, and even Germany. Um, but we will have uh, also important elections in other countries in 2017. In Germany, will Angela Merkel survive? In, in the Netherlands, um, will the far right make election gains there? And the far right are kind of pro-Putin, um, and um, and and also in um, um, Poland as well, um, where the nationalist right who are in power, on the one hand, are pro-Ukrainian, but on the other hand, seem to be willing to fan anti-Ukrainian sentiment over historical events that took place uh, in the 1940s. So it's 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 a mixed picture. Um, I would say a dangerous picture. Um, you would have thought that um, after Putin got a bloody nose in 2014 um, from Ukrainian patriots um, who destroyed his plans for a so-called new Russia in eastern and southern Ukraine, that this was over. But it seems not. Pinchuk um, is proposing, and he's an important Ukrainian oligarch, um, He's proposing basically Ukraine's capitulation to Russia. Um, Trump seems to be saying the same thing, um, and he's maybe sending Kissinger along to do that. Um, so let's hope that um, this doesn't happen. One final thing here: it shows that Ukraine's oligarchs cannot be trusted with Ukraine's national security, and that they are not really patriots. They are opportunists who are willing to sell the country out and in particular their main uh, importance is their own egos like Trump um, and also their wallets, their pocketbooks. Um, But as I say, and I'll repeat, Ukrainians, we know from 2014 when there wasn't really much of an army, um, will not agree to be consigned to a Belarusian-style dominion in the Russian uh, sphere of influence. So whatever Trump thinks, whatever Kissinger and Pinchuk thinks, um, I don't believe it's, it's feasible. But this could create tension, instability, destabilization, and other things um, in Ukraine and the region in general. And if anything we know about uh, Vladimir Putin, this is what he's very good at. Um, creating dissension, uh, coup, de, coup de plots, cyber hacking, information warfare, and such like. Um, and this is not really 
something that would be helpful um, at a time when Ukraine's economy is just about to recover um, as well. So 2017, will Ukraine survive it? Probably, um, but it will face tremendous challenges ahead. Um, We hope Ukraine's leaders um, will be able to face those. One of the first things that President Petro Poroshenko should do is refuse, like any other Ukrainian patriot, to sit at the same table as Viktor Pinchuk at the January Davos summit, where Pinchuk usually has um, tables that he's paid for. They should boycott anything to do with Viktor Pinchuk um, because he is basically going along with this capitulation. Um, And also, come September, they should all boycott his so-called Yalta European strategy. Thank you very much.